So I'm going to talk about, I've split my talk into two general aspects today. The first third of it is going to be a general review of what single strand brake repair is, um, at least from the perspective of how my lab think of single strand brake repair. And also to give you some idea of the, the emerging connections between defects in this process and human genetic disease. Um, and then I want to spend the last two thirds or last half of the talk um, talking about some work that we published late last year, which I guess quite a few of you probably seen the paper because I saw it on Alessandro's desks. But um, hopefully um, I can give you a little bit more insight from, 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 from just the paper's perspective on that. So let's see. So um, I'm not sure, I don't entirely know how broad an experience the audience is in terms of DNA damage. So I put in a couple of or at least one introductory slide to try and orientate you a little bit to what DNA damage is, for those of you who are not really familiar with it. So this is clearly one strand of a DNA double helix, and of course it's made up of a sugar phosphate backbone, shown at the bottom, and the nuclear base is shown on the top. And pretty much, although we think of DNA as a stable structure, it has a certain intrinsic instability associated with its chemistry. And in particular, Many, many of the bonds that make up DNA are subject to nucleophilic attack by reactive oxygen species or uh, other electrophilic molecules like alkylating agents. And even, even hydrolytic attack of some of the bonds are also, is also a major problem to cells. So if the sugar phosphate backbone is damaged, and in particular it's, it's damaged most commonly by reactive oxygen molecules through hydrogen extraction at the different carbon positions, that can result in disintegration of the deoxyribose moiety and essentially then disintegration of the sugar phosphate backbone. And that's how most single strand breaks and actually double strand breaks arise in cells um, during normal uh, cellular metabolism, disintegration through um, oxidative attack of deoxyribose. But of course the bases are also subject to attack and those are attacked at many different positions through alkylating agents, and so that's endogenous alkylating compounds, um, reactive oxygen species, and also, as I said, mentioned, glycolysis of some of these bonds, glycolysis of some of these bonds, uh, hydrolysis of some of these bonds, in particular, the, um, uh, the bond linking the sugar to, to the nuclear base is a particular problematic one, because the DNA then loses coding information, of course. But many positions in the bases are subject to hydrolytic attack and deamination, alkylation attack, and as I mentioned, um, oxi oxi uh, reactive oxygen species. So there are many, many types of damage going on in cells all of the time, and we, the number that you'll see in the literature is tens to hundreds of thousands of DNA damaging events per cell per day. So DNA repair really is, is, is uh, required to maintain DNA in a stable constitution and is operative all of the time. And in particular, the pathway I'm going to talk about, which is single strand break repair, which repairs these kinds of structures, is, is very much a housekeeping process. It's occurring all of the time um, to maintain your chromosomes in an intact state. So this is my sort of cartoon of a single strand break. The two features to note are that typically single strand break is comprised of um, a break in which one nucleotide is missing. So there's a missing base, a whole missing nucleotide from this region, and that has to be replaced. And the other thing to note about the chemistry is that the termini are often, are often damaged, and that's denoted by these little red blobs. So these little, little red blobs tell you that the chemistry that should be present at a DNA terminus, which is a 5' prime phosphate and a 3' prime hydroxyl, is actually absent. And there can be all kinds of different structures present at termini, and it's absolutely critical for a cell to repair those termini before the final repair events of gap filling, where you replace the missing information, and finally ligation can actually occur. And as you'll see, end processing, as we call it, is a major step in the single strand break repair process. If you don't repair these structures quickly, this is just the origin of breaks, as I mentioned, from damage to sugar, damage to bases. Damage to bases results in single strand breaks because um, damaged bases are processed by a repair pathway known as base excision repair. And single strand breaks are created as normal intermediates of that process. Uh, single strand breaks also arise from abortive topoisomerase 1 activity, and I'm going to spend quite a lot of time talking about abortive topoisomerase activity um, throughout this talk, and I'll, co I'll come back to this in a little bit more detail. But if you don't repair single strand breaks quickly enough, or in an appropriate fashion, they can have a variety of consequences to the cell. So if a single strand break is allowed to uh, persist into S phase, 
and a replication fork encounters that break, it can collapse the fork, resulting in a double strand break, as shown here. And collapsed replication forks are, of course, potentially very clastogenic, very cytotoxic lesions. In non-cycling cells, or even in cycling cells outside of S phase, single strand breaks can also block the progression of RNA polymerases. And particularly single strand breaks that have these damaged termini as denoted by red blobs. It's been shown by Paul Deutsch and others that RNA polymerases really struggle to transcribe past the single strand break that has chemically modified termini. So they block transcription. And this actually may have a really important consequence to cells in terms of the types of genetic disease that we're finding arise in individuals with defects in single strand break repair. And the third consequence to unrepaired single strand breaks is overactivation of poly ADP ribose polymerase 1. So, part 1 is itself a single strand break repair enzyme. It's the molecule that senses single strand breaks in cells. And once it binds to single strand breaks, it becomes catalytically activated. Now, if that break is not repaired quickly enough, part will continue to be active and will, will deplete the cell of the cofactor that it uses. Um, during its activity, which is NAD. And NAD is an energy cofactor. Depletion of NAD will essentially deplete the cell of energy and will result in cell death through necrosis or apoptosis um, um, or through a variety of mechanisms. So excessive or, excessive or prolonged PARP activation will kill cells. In actual fact, this type of death is thought to be involved in uh, neuronal cell death during stroke, for example, and in rat models of ischemia reperfusion injury where you deprive the brain of oxygen for a while and then allow the oxygen to uh, flow back through the brain, you get massive cell death in the nervous system. And that's um, a large component of that is PARP dependent and it's thought to be overactivation of PARP, energy depletion and, and neural cell death. Okay. <laughs> So this is um, a cartoon of single strand break repair as, as um, my lab tends to think of it. At the top we have detection of the break by polydicoribose polymerase as I just mentioned. These little red spider legs if you like are, denote the fact that when part binds to breaks it's catalytically activated and its major substrate is itself. So it auto modifies itself with long chains of poly ADP ribose and that's what these, these red um, lines are intended to denote. And that really serves as a damage signal to tell the cell that at this particular part of the chromosome, there is a single strand break and the cell needs to do something about it. And one of the ways in which a cell responds to that is to bring in the enzymatic components of the repair process to deal with a single strand break structure. And the first enzymatic step of repair is this, <coughs> proce this process of end -proce processing that I alluded to, where you deal with these structures on the damaged structures on the terminus and in this case now they're yellow blobs instead of red, but essentially it's the, same, it's the same problem. And these can be of a variety of different chemistries. And the chemistry of the terminus is very much dependent on the source of the break. So oxidative damage or oxidative induced breaks will have a certain kind of chemistry. Breaks arising from base damage will have a different kind of chemistry. And the upshot of that is that you need a variety of enzymes available to deal with the different chemistries. And these are some of the end processing factors. Um, that are involved. Polynucleotide kinase, I'll briefly mention a bit later on. Aprotaxin is a very specific 5 prime end processing factor. TDP1 is a 3 prime end processing factor. This protein, XRCC1, is, um, is um, a component of a heterodimer with DNA ligase 3. And XRCC1 is not thought to have an enzymatic role during the repair process. Rather, it's thought to be a scaffold protein. So it interacts with a lot of the enzymes involved in repair and brings them together very quickly at sites of breaks and thereby accelerates the overall repair process or the rate of the repair process. Once the damaged termini have been dealt with, then any missing information, and usually it's a single nucleotide, can be replaced by DNA polymerase beta. Once that nucleotide's placed, replaced, all you need to do is reseal the NIC and DNA ligase 3 will conduct, conduct that very effectively. And this sub-pathway we call short patch repair. And it's called short patch repair because you're replacing a single nucleotide, just the nucleotide that was missing uh, when the break was induced. There is 20% of the time, based on in vitro reactions, uh, a sub-pathway that's called long patch repair. In this process, instead of replacing just a single nucleotide, you replace multiple nucleotides. But because the break was only missing one nucleotide to begin with, by definition that means that you end up with strand displacement and then you need a nuclease called FEN1 to clip off the flap. So this is flap endonuclease 1. 
and we call this long patch repair because you're inserting multiple nucleotides, typically up to about 10, but it could possibly be more in cells. And that uses a different ligase, it uses ligase 1 to reseal the neck, and it utilizes the replicative polymerases, pol delta epsilon uh, and pCNA, probably serves a similar sort of scaffolding function <coughs> during long patch repair as, as XRCC1 does during short patch repair. So this is an overview of the pathway. Now in the past seven or eight years it's become apparent that mutations in components of this pathway are associated with human genetic disease. In particular, the end processing factor apotaxin is mutated in a disease called ataxia ocular motor apraxia 1. That's quite a mouthful, so we tend to call this AOA1. And the end processing factor TDP1 is mutated in a disease called spinocerebellar ataxia with axonal neuropathy 1. That's an even bigger mouthful, and we call that SCAN1. And the important feature about these diseases, and that, that surprise does at least when, when um, these diseases were sort of identified as associated with single strand brain repair defects was that they are primarily neurological disorders. In both of these diseases, the primary pathology is, de is progressive degeneration in the cerebellum, as shown here in these um, red circles. This is a normal cerebellum. It's progressive, so it gets worse with age. And the consequence of that is um, a pathology known as spinocerebellar ataxia, which is an inability to control movement accurately. So the cerebellum is the organ responsible for, for fine motor control. And as that degrades, these individuals have uh, an inability to walk um, in a straight line, for example. They have a very unsteady or unbalanced gait. And they have a difficulty in other sort of motor, conscious motor functions as well. Um, the biggest surprise to us with these diseases is that there is no predisposition to cancer. We think we understand why this is now, but this is one of the big questions that we're trying to address. We have some ideas why this is, and I'll just briefly um, summarize those ideas in, in a few minutes. But this was a big surprise to us at the time, the fact there was no cancer involved. Given that these will be collapsed in replication forks if they're not repaired, these single-strand breaks generating double-strand breaks, you would think there would be a cancer involvement here, but there doesn't appear to be. The neurological um, component to these diseases, in retrospect, is not such a big surprise. Because many of the DNA damage defective disorders known to date have a neurological component to them. And I've summarized that on this slide. So at the top, we have the nucleotide excision repair defective disorders, which repair, for example, UV photoproducts or other types of bulky lesion in the brain. And they result in neurodegeneration, ataxia, microcephaly, which is a small, uh, a, small than, than a very small head, if you like, or a smaller than a, uh, average head. And progeria, so these are premature age, this is a premature aging um, group of syndromes. We have the two diseases I just mentioned, which we tend to think of as single strand brain repair defective, but I have highlighted in red here the, uh, the possibility that both of these disorders may have a double strand brain repair defect component too. Now, we've not been able to detect double strand brain repair defects in these diseases or cells from these diseases. However, both of them are implicated in double strand brain repair through protein protein interaction analysis, for example, in the case of AOA1. Uh, or through in vitro assays in the case of uh, SCAM1. But um, as I say, we, we, this, we've never seen double strand brain repair defects in these diseases, but that's not been ruled out. And of course, as I mentioned, these have neurodegeneration and ataxia. Classical double strand brain repair defective diseases shown in the uh, next grouping um, tend to be associated either with no neuropathology or with microcephaly and cognitive delay. Not so much neurodegeneration in these disorders, which tends to separate them from what we think of as a single strand break repair defective diseases. And then the bottom group uh, comprised a mixed bunch of um, DNA damage sensing enzymes involved in sensing single-stranded DNA or double-strand breaks. And they have microcephaly, mental deficiency, neurodegeneration, ataxia. So a fairly broad spectrum of neurological um, pathologies in these diseases. Uh, this is the only slide I'm really going to show you today as to why we think defects in single-strand brain repair might impact on the nervous system, and we're trying to pursue these questions using <coughs> in vivo mouse model systems at the moment. The nervous system, we think, is severely affected because there's very high levels of oxidative stress in the brain, and oxidative stress is a major way in which single-strand breaks arise, um, even during normal cellular metabolism. The brain is thought to, to utilize 20% of inhaled oxygen, so that gives you some idea of how much oxidative metabolism is occurring. There are high levels of transcription in the brain, or perhaps more specifically, there's a very broad spectrum of trans 
grips required in neurons to keep neurons functional. And I mentioned at the beginning, one of the impacts of loss of single strand brain repair on a cell would be blockage to progressing RNA polymerases. So we think that unrepaired single strand breaks have a potential to disrupt transcription in long-lived postmitotic neurons, particularly over a long period of, of time, resulting in, in neural cell death. And of course, neurons are classically uh, very limited in terms of their regenerative capacity. Why no genetic instability in cancer? This is a really interesting question. And our working model at the moment is that proliferating cells, which of course, if you're going to develop a cancer, then it, that invokes by definition proliferating cells. Proliferating cells have alternative ways of dealing with single strand breaks once they encounter them at a replication fork. So those single strand breaks will collapse into double strand breaks, which in itself is a very dangerous situation for the cell to be in. But cells actually have extremely efficient mechanisms for dealing with that scenario. And I'm not going to talk about the mechanisms today, but the particular mechanism I'm thinking of is something called homologous recombination, which I think many of you will have come across. Homologous recombination probably evolved, at least in somatic cells, um, to deal with the situation where NICs collapse the replication fork. And we think that's protecting proliferating cells in these individuals from uh, any persistent long-lasting damage. And we certainly see evidence for that in cultured lymphoblastoid cells from these diseases, for example. And of course, proliferating tissues, such as the liver, for example, have a higher regenerative capacity. So if you do have cell death resulting from unrepaired single strand breaks, there's a greater chance that you can replace the missing cells in those tissues. Okay, so we have now moved on to mouse model systems to try and address some of these questions. And I'm just going to show you a couple of slides on this to illustrate um, where this work's sort of leading us. This is all a collaboration with Peter McKinnon, who's been working with mouse model systems of DNA damage defective disorders for a long time. And we've generated mice that are defective in apotaxin, so these mimic the AOA1 disease, and mice defective in TDP1 that mimic SCAM1 disease. And unfortunately, and this is not uncommon in the DNA damage, certainly in the neurodegeneration field, um, from a DNA damage perspective, these mice do not recapitulate the pathology of the patients. They do not show overt neurodegeneration. We can see some subtle degeneration whoops, in the SCAM1 mouse, uh, so, for example, over a 13-month period, if you compare the cerebellar size compared to the rest of the brain, you find that the cerebellum of the SCAM1 mice is reduced by about 10 to 15 percent, which is not, not a result that you get excited and jump up and down about, but it, there's something progressive occurring. If you put these animals through behavioral tests, such as rotor rod that require motor coordination, they have a subtle defect. So these animals will stay on a rotor rod. Um, they're, they're less able to com cope with a uh, a rotor rod as uh, compared to a wild type mouse. And for those of you not familiar with the rotor rod system, essentially it's a wheel that the mouse sits on and it has to walk to stay uh, on top of the wheel and that requires motor coordination. So the, the length of time or the speed of the wheel that they can, main, they can um, um, come deal with is a reflection of their motor, motor control. But still, those animals are not particularly exciting. The reason we think that these animals don't really recapitulate the pathology in the diseases, it comes back to the fact that both of these proteins are involved in end processing steps. And in particular, both of these proteins deal with a very specific subset of damaged termini. Uh, and probably at physiological levels of damage, a very small subset of the types of, d of breaks arising in cells. And we think that in mice, mice just do not live long enough for those types of damage to accumulate to, to start impacting on the nervous system in any, in any uh, major way. So with Peter, we looked at a different model system, which was a mouse in which XRCC1 had been disrupted specifically in the brain. XRCC1 is required to accelerate all single strand break repair events, irrespective of the type of damage terminus. So it should have a much more penetrative, penetrative impact on the repair process. And certainly when you look at mice, XRCC1 mice with specific disruption um, in the brain, you find that they're smaller. So this is a neurological specific phenomena because it's only the brain in which the gene is knocked out, so they're smaller. Uh, they also have problems with motor coordination, so now this is a hanging wire test which tests the neuromuscular ability of the animal to hold on to a wire mesh and also to, um, to m move around that wire mesh. So what you do is you put the mouse on the mesh, turn the mesh upside down, the mouse will try and crawl along it and move on to the top of the mesh. And so this is a way of uh, measuring the animal's motor coordination and, and also neuromuscular ability, and these are severely affected. They also have some um, visible ataxia just when you watch the animals move, you can see that they have a sort of um, 
um, Charlie Chaplin or paddle type motion to their back legs implying some sort of motor uh, co uh, coordination problem there as well. And they have a severe single strand brake repair defect in, in their neurons consistent with the idea that XRCC1 is a fundamental single strand brake repair protein. So we have a radiation induced single strand brakes here in the wild type animal. Similar levels of brakes are induced but the wild type animal will repair those very quickly within one to two hours. So this is a very fast process but you can see it's much slower in the knockout animals and hydrogen peroxide gives you a similar result. So the neurons in these animals are very defective in terms of their single strand brake repair capacity. What struck us as particularly interesting was a phenotype that we'd not encountered before, um, which was a seizure phenotype. And I'm going to show a very short video now. The, the video, so these animals have periodic seizures and they're quite difficult to catch and we were lucky to catch one on this video. The mice tend to live three or four months and then they die, probably because of these seizures become more frequent with time, although they're still quite difficult to catch. What you'll see on the video is this is a wild type mouse the camera will suddenly switch to the other end of the cage and you'll see an XRCC1 mouse having a seizure. They don't, he doesn't die from a seizure, but the mouse sort of sits quietly afterwards and we think these get progressively worse. So that's the wild type and now you can see the XRCC1 mouse having a seizure. This is some form of epilepsy, we think, but we don't have any electrophysiology to really define this at this stage. But you can see once the seizure is over, it tends, the mouse sort of sits quietly there. Now the reason, um, the reason the seizures, so we had this observation for maybe six months, didn't quite know what to make of it, except that it's clearly neurological, but the reason it became interesting is that, um, oops, I might skip the slide there, there we go, is that um, we were um, approached by a scientist at Harvard called Christopher Walsh, and Christopher had been studying the genetic basis of a disease called microcephaly with early onset seizures. <coughs> And what Christopher discovered was that these were due to mutations in polynucleotide kinase, which is one of those M processing factors that I showed you in the single strand brake repair process. So it's this protein here. So in fact, we now have another disease associated with this machinery, which is, multiple, uh, which is microcephaly with early onset seizures. And um, we think that this disease has seizures because PNK, like XRCC1, has a much more penetrative role in single strand brake repair. A much higher proportion of brakes require PNK for this end processing step. In fact, 70% of all oxidative induced brakes require PNK activity to deal with these structures. So we think severe single strand brake repair defects uh, impact, in fact, on um, the uh, regions of the brain that if defective result in, in seizures and that primarily is the hippocampus. So we've added this disease now sort of down here somewhere between the single strand brake repair disorders and the double strand brake repair disorders. The, the microcephaly we think is, is, relates to the fact that PNK is also implicated in double strand brake repair. So maybe the double strand brake repair defect results in microcephaly and the, single strand, the severe single strand brake repair defect results in the seizures. So what I want to move on to now is uh, away from the single strand brake repair pathway as a whole and focus on this molecule TDP1, uh, which is mutated in uh, one of the neurological disorders I showed you earlier. And we were very interested in TDP1 because the type of activity this enzyme has uh, has, has not been identified in any, any other protein in the cell. And we were keen, given its important utility in preventing disease, we were, we were very keen to see if we could identify other activities of this type. And I'll, I'll show you in a minute what that activity is. So this is the type of repair process that TDP1 is involved in. It's a very specific type of single strand brake repair reaction because TDP1 is an end processing factor and it has a very specific type of damage termini that it deals with. And I've tried to illustrate that here. So this is a single strand break that's arisen through the abortive activity of topisomerase 1. Now topisomerase 1 um, spends its entire life making transient single strand breaks in DNA to release torsional stress from chromosomes during replication and transcription, for example. So it releases supercoils and it can untangle um, DNA to a certain extent. It's involved in releasing torsional stress generated ahead of um, uh, are moving RNA polymerases, for example. So when topisomerase 1 relaxes DNA, it nicks DNA, becomes covalently attached to the 3' prime terminus, as shown here, through a phosphotyrosyl linkage. Once the torsional stress is released, the topisomerase itself will then reseal the break, and then the enzyme will float off and relax DNA in a different part of the chromosome. However, on, 
under certain conditions, uh, the tope isomerase can become trapped. Now in the cell, this is, you tend to induce this kind of abortive activity by treating with camptothecin, which is a drug many of you, I'm sure those of you working on DNA damage will be familiar with. And camptothecin is also an anti cancer or at least derivatives of camptothecin are very important anti-cancer agents. And they kill tumor cells specifically by inhibiting the ability of tope isomerase 1 to re-ligate those breaks once the torsional stress has been released. So they inhibit the last step of a tope isomerase 1 catalytic reaction. What that means is, is that now the cell has to deal with that break because the tope isomerase is not able to. So this type of structure, once it becomes abortive, is channeled into the single strand break repair machinery. And the first, one of the first steps of that repair process is to cleave this phosphotyrosyl linkage so that you can take away the protein from the break. The very first step, however, is a proteolytic step using the proteasome. The proteasome recognizes this very large polypeptide on the end of DNA, covalently linked, and degrades most of it down to an as yet undetermined size. But it still leaves this phosphotyrosyl linkage, so you still have a tyrosine link to the 3' end plus some unspecified length of peptide. And it's the job of TDP1 here to specifically cleave this phosphotyrosyl link. And it does that in a very neat hydrolytic fashion and essentially then leaves a break that carries a 3' phosphate and a 5' hydroxyl. These termini are in red because they also are damaged termini. Those are not the correct chemistry for a repair event to go ahead. So that phosphate should be a hydroxyl, and conversely, this hydroxyl should be a phosphate. But very neatly, those are both substrates of PNK. So PNK has a phosphatase activity that will convert this 3' end to a hydroxyl, and it has a 5' DNA kinase activity that will convert this hydroxyl to a phosphate. And PNK is actually this protein I was just talking about that's mutated in um, the seizure syndrome. And this is a multi-protein complex, we think. Following again, once end processing is completed by TDP1 and PNK, then you just need ligase 3 to reseal this nick. So this is a very fast, very effective reaction. It's occurring all the time. Well, wherever topisomerase reactions become abortive, this is occurring. But TDP1 was the only tyrosyl phosphodiesterase identified in cells. And we were, for a variety of reasons I'm not going to go into for time reasons, we were very keen to investigate whether cells possess other types of tyrosyl phosphodiesterase activity. In particular, whether there's another enzyme activity that might be able to compensate for the loss of TDP1. And this was the work of um, Philippe Cortez Ledesma in my lab, a Spanish postdoc who's now got his own lab back in Sevilla, and uh, Sharif El Camisi who's now got also got his own lab actually at the Genome Center. And the question was, do human cells possess possess other tyrosyl phosphodiesterases. So Felipe went about answering this question using his favorite model organism, which is budding yeast. And what Felipe used was a, a well-established budding yeast strain that lacks the yeast homologue of TDP1, but it also lacks a nuclease called RAD1. Now you don't need to worry about what RAD1 is. In budding yeast, RAD1 is a redundant factor with TDP1, so you need to mutate both of these genes to make those yeast sensitive to topisomerase 1 associated damage. And the way we're inducing topoisomerase 1 associated damage here is using camptothecin. So you can see the strain in red is hypersensitive to camptothecin. So these are dilution series. So this is a, each of these is a tenfold dilution of the previous one. And we're look, you're looking at the growth of budding yeast on, on plates. So hypersensitivity to camptothecin in the mutant strain. So the question Felipe asked was very simple. He took a human cDNA library and asked if we introduce that library into this strain, are there any proteins in a human cDNA library or genes in a human cDNA library that can compensate for the loss of TDP1 and restore camptothecin resistance? And he identified six clones that restored this strain to wild-type resistance to camptothecin, three of which were human TDP1, which makes sense because it's essentially the human equivalent of the gene mutated in the budding yeast, or the budding yeast gene that's mutated in that strain. But the other, the other three were far more interesting, and they were a, a human protein that, was known, that had been identified and described in the literature as T-trap. And if you look at the literature, um, at, at, this, at the time that we pulled this out of the library, um, then there was a real sort of mixed bag of publications describing the function of this protein, none of which was particularly exciting from a DNA damage repair perspective. So, for example, the name comes from TTRAF and TNF receptor associated protein. So, TTRAF interacts with the uh, TNF receptor CD40 and the, and the CD40 interacting factor TRAF6. It, it impinges on NF kappa B signaling and transcriptional regulation if you overexpress it. 
interacts with ETS1 transcription factor if you overexpress it. Uh, it's been reported to interact with the Parkinson's disease protein, but um, these were generally overexpression studies. The bottom one is the, perhaps the most convincing report, and in zebrafish, if you knock down T-trap, it has an embryonic phenotype. It disrupts um, left-right axis um, um, axis determination during embryonic development. But the molecular function of the protein was unknown. So as I say, this was not particularly exciting from a DNA repair perspective, but when you looked at the structure of the protein, it looked a lot more interesting because two-thirds of T-trap is comprised of a phosphodiesterase domain. And this phosphodiesterases are a well-known class of activities involved in DNA repair reactions. And this one in particular was very interesting because if you looked at the um, conservation of this protein, then the regions of most conservation, which are shown by these red asterisks, actually tend to localize around the red boxes. And these red boxes, number one, two, three, and four, denote this protein as a putative member of the metal-dependent phosphodiesterase superfamily. And that's a very interesting fat superfamily from a repair perspective because the best known member of that family is a protein called APN denuclease 1, which is a single strand break repair protein um, involved in repair of base damage in actual fact. So it looked like T-trap is related to um, APN denuclease 1, at least in its structural comparison. Interestingly, uh, T-trap is not conserved as far as we can tell below, below worms, so there's no homolog that we can identify in yeast. So the, f the next question Felipe asked was, is the phosphodiesterase domain important for T-TRAP's ability to complement a TDP1 defective yeast strain? So the way he did that was to put in specific mutations in the catalytically active site of this domain and then ask if that, those proteins were able to confer resistance to camptothecin and they're not. So here we have wild type human TDP1 restoring camptothecin resistance and uh, wild type T-trap can, but the two catalytic mutants were completely unable to. Uh, they were no better at conferring camptothecin resistance than was empty vector. So you need the catalytic active site for camptothecin resistance in yeast, telling you that this probably does require phosphodiesterase activity. Felipe was concerned about the specificity of this reaction, and in particular, he was worried whether or not complementation of camptothecin resistance in this uh, TDP1 defective strain, was that a general feature of all members of this phosphodiesterase superfamily, or was it a specific function of, of T-trap? So he didn't look at all of the members of this family, that would take too long. What he did was to choose the member of this family that was closest, most closely related to T-trap, and that was APN denuclease 1, this repair enzyme um, that I mentioned. And you can see here that human APN denuclease 1 is not able to restore camptothecin resistance to TDP1 defective yeast in contrast to T-trap. So the conclusion from that was that complementation of the camptothecin sensitivity of this strain is not a generic feature of the metal-dependent phosphodiesterase family. It seems to be specific to T-trap, at least in the context of the experiments we've conducted. Felipe also asked the reverse question, which was, um, does T, is T-TRAP able to confer resistance to other types of damage that induce different types of um, phosphodiesterase substrates? And so the one he chose, the DNA damaging agent he chose was MMS because MMS is the preferred substrate for APN denuclease 1. And whereas APN denuclease 1 can restore resistance to MMS in an, in an APN denuclease defective yeast strain, so the, each of these genes is a, a gene implicated in the repair of um, MMS induced damage. You can see APN denuclease will restore that, but T-trap will not. So the converse is true. So T-trap um, is not able to repair other types of phosphodiesterase substrates. It appears to be specific to top one damage. So the real important question then was, does T-trap display three prime tyrosyl phosphodiesterase activity in vitro? So can it do the same job that TDP1 does in vitro? And to test that, Felipe generated three proteins, human TDP1 as a positive control, T-TRAP, which is a test protein, and APN denuclease as a negative control. And the DNA substrate he used is shown here. It's a duplex oligonucleotide. The top strand on the left here is an 18 that's labeled with 32P phosphate, so you can, um, you can um, follow its um, migration during electrophoresis. And we have this phosphotyrosyl linkage here, which mimics the types of break that topisomerases induce. So this isn't the identical type of bond that's present in topisomerase one associated breaks. 
The experiment's very simple. If T-trap will cleave this phosphatyrosyl bond, i.e. If, it's, if it has T3 prime TDP activity, then it will convert that 18-mer to a form that now just has a 3 prime phosphate. It's chopped off the tyrosine. And those two oligonucleotides have very different electrophoretic mobility on, um, during gel electrophoresis, so you can monitor their progress during electrophoresis. We also did the same experiment on a double strand break type substrate as well as a single strand break type substrate. And the result of that experiment is shown here. So here's a substrate before you add any protein to it. This is the substrate once you've incubated it with TDP1. Now remember TDP1 is a bona fide 3' tyrosyl phosphodiesterase, so this is our positive control. <coughs> and you can see now that this 18 mer has shifted its electrophoretic mobility from the position of an 18 mer with a 3' tyrosine to an 18 mer with a 3' phosphate. So that's the, that's the positive control. APN denuclease is a negative control that has no activity on this structure and we're using much higher concentrations of APN denuclease, 540 nanomolar as opposed to 80 nanomolar for TDP1. What about T-trap? Well, T-trap uh, is both good and bad. The good um, part of this experiment is that T-trap does have some 3' TDP activity, you can see here. The bad part is that it's very weak. So we have less than 50% conversion under these conditions and uh, we're actually using far higher levels of T-trap than we are TDP1. So it does have some 3' TDP activity but not very much. And this is a quantitative comparison. Uh, enzyme concentration against percent conversion, TDP1 is very effective. T-trap is about 50-fold less effective than TDP1. Okay? But that activity is due to T-trap. It's not an E. coli contaminant because the catalytic mutant T-trap doesn't have this activity. So our conclusion from that work was that T-trap does possess 3' TDP activity in vitro, but it's weak. But we think that weak activity accounts for why we recovered this protein in our yeast screen in the first place. So although it's weak activity, it was sufficient to restore camptothecin resistance to those TDP1 defective um, yeast cells. But maybe this is not the primary activity of this enzyme. So what might be the primary activity of this enzyme, i.e. what's its physiological substrate? Well, there are multiple topoisomerases in cells, and because of the results with um, our in vitro experiments and the fact that the complementation of the yeast seemed to be specific to topoisomerase damage, we were particularly interested in the possibility of um, its true substrate being some other type of abortive topoisomerase structure. And in terms of abortive activity, it's known that as, as well as topoisomerase 1 generating breaks, abortive topo 2 um, can result in breaks. So we can induce topo-1 breaks using camptothecin, and you can induce topo-2 breaks using atopicide. And atopicide, again, is another anti-cancer agent. But there's a big difference between the type of breaks induced by these two um, topoisomerases. So topoisomerase 1, as I've mentioned, induces these uh, um, topoisomerase-associated single-strand breaks, whereas top-2 induces double-strand breaks. But there's another fundamental difference here that was of more interest to us. Whereas top 1 generates a phosphotyrosyl linkage at the 3' prime end of a break, top 2 generates a phosphotyrosyl linkage at the 5' prime end of a break, a double strand break in this case. So it's exactly the same type of bonds, phosphotyrosyl, but it's on the different terminus. Now TDP1 is the enzyme of choice for dealing with a 3' prime phosphotyrosyl linkage, but an enzyme that deals with a 5' prime phosphotyrosyl linkage had never been identified in human cells, despite the fact that these are actually very important breaks. So atopicide is a cytotoxic anti-cancer agent. It kills tumor cells by inducing these types of double strand breaks. It's also very clastogenic. So one of the problems of atopicide treatment for treating cancers is the induction of secondary leukemias. And very often those leukemias are associated with site-specific translocations, and, uh, for example, on chromosome 11. It's thought that those sites of translocation are hotspots for topo2 activity. So these breaks are both clastogenic and cytotoxic but no known enzyme has been identified for cleaving these phosphotyrosyl linkages. I'm going to try and speed up a little bit in a minute. So to address whether T-trap might actually be this elusive 5' prime TDP activity, we <coughs> conducted similar types of in vitro experiments as to the 3' prime TDP activity. So we use another oligonucleotide structure, but now we shifted the phosphotyrosyl linkage to the 5' prime end of the break, but it's exactly the same type of um, reaction. If T-trap can cleave this phosphotyrosyl linkage, it will convert that 19 mer to a form that migrates more rapidly on a gel. And the outcome of the experiment is shown here. So in the very left, lane one, we have the substrate. 
Lane two, we have the substrate incubator with AP endonuclease. That's our negative control. So AP endonuclease does not process this structure, even though it's the closest relative in, the phos in this metal-dependent phosphodiesterase superfamily. TDP1 similarly will not process this structure. So although TDP1 is a fantastic enzyme for, for cleaving this bond on a three prime end, it's hopeless at cleaving it on a five prime end. But T-trap on the other hand, you can see does this very effectively. And these are all uh, equimolar amounts of enzyme here. I think it's 100 nanomolar in this experiment. And the catalytic mutants of T-trap are completely dead. So T-trap does indeed have five prime TDP activity. And those are just some controls and I'm gonna skip through for time reasons. And I'm going to skip through that one as well. So if you now compare these two activities, TDP1, which is a 3-prime tyrosyl phosphodiesterase, T-trap, which is a 5-prime uh, tyrosyl phosphodiesterase, you find now the cell has complementary activities. So TDP1 is able to very effectively repair <coughs> DNA breaks that have topisomerase 1 on the 3-prime end. But T-traps can do that, but not very well. That's the data I showed you earlier. But if you now flip to a 5' prime terminus with a topisomerase trapped on it, then T-trap can do that almost as well as TDP1 does a 3' prime terminus. But TDP1 on this substrate is dead. So together, TDP1 and T-trap provide the cell with the full complement of enzymes needed to remove topisomerases from 5' prime or 3' prime termini. So does T-trap function in um, DNA repair in vivo? And I've got maybe five more slides before I finish just illustrating this. No yeah, but an hour's pushing it. I don't want to go over an hour. <laughs> You'll all be asleep. Um, so the first experiment we tried to see if T-trap was actually going to sites of damage and involved in repairing cells was a, was a standard one in the field now, which is to GFP tag the protein and then drive into the cell a UVA laser, a stripe of UVA laser damage, and that's what this green stripe is here, in essence. Uh, and what we're putting there is using a laser to introduce oxidative damage in a very defined stripe. And then you can look at recruitment of different proteins to that site of damage. And if a protein goes there, it generally implies a protein's involved in, in either detecting that damage or repairing that damage. And you can see that T-trap does go to this um, stripe, but it goes there quite weakly. Not, if this was XRCC1, for example, which is that core component of single strand break repair, all of this green signal would coalesce into that stripe, but only a small amount of T-traps going there. And we think that's because UVA laser, which is a form of oxidative damage, is not very good at inducing topoisomerase 2 um, type breaks. <coughs> it can induce those breaks, but it does it very indirectly by, by uh, effectively putting in oxidative lesions in close proximity to sites of TOPO2 activity. And that's actually another way of trapping topoisomerases. They don't like to conduct their catalytic activity close to other lesions because it actually uh, results in blocking or inhibiting the topoisomerase ligation activity. So we think this is quite a weak strike because only a small amount of the damage induced here is actually topoisomerase 2 associated. Uh, you'll see there's these green blobs and we always find T-trap in these, and it turns out these are PML bodies. If any of you are interested in PML bodies, we can talk about that afterwards. So the upshot of this experiment is that it does look like T-trap goes to sites of damage, at least. If we now take human cells, in this case it's a long carcinoma cell, and knock down T-trap stably with a P-super construct. So this is the T-trap band here. This is the wild-type um, cell line, or the control knockdown, if you like. This is a non-specific band on top, and XRCC on top. So these both serve as loading controls. This knockdown is about 80%, we think, between 80 and 90%. If you now look at the sensitivity of these cells to different DNA damaging agents, they're not sensitive to camptothesin. Well, that makes sense, because I've shown you already that uh, T-trap is actually not very good at repairing 3' phosphotyrosyl linkages, which is the type of linkage put in by camptothesin, because camptothesin inhibits TOPO1. It is very sensitive, well, it's sensitive to a topicide, so that makes sense, because a topicide is the way that you specifically induce TOPO2 associated double strand breaks, so that makes sense. It's not sensitive to MMS, an alkylating agent. This puts in damage that's a substrate for AP endonuclease. That makes sense because AP endonuclease has a very different substrate um, spectrum to T-trap. So the sensitivity profile fits with the in vitro data. If we measure double strand breaks directly in these cells using uh, gamma H2AX assays, so this histone variant, H2AX, becomes phosphorylated at sites of double strand breaks, and there are antibodies that can pick up 
those phosphorylated histone sites very effectively. And you can monitor double-strand brake repair by counting um, foci of gamma H to AX. And if those of you here for Penny's talk, I think Penny gave a talk recently, which well, Penny will have used these assays quite um, um, for, for, a, for most of her work in actual fact. So you'll have encountered these. So if we use gamma H to AX as an indirect measure of double-strand brake repair, you can see that the um, mock knockdown in the open bars and the knockdown in the black bars having similar levels of damage induced by gamma ray, this is in G1, but you can see whereas the wild type cells repair quite quickly, there's delayed repair in the uh, T-trap knockdown, and that's true in G2 as well. So there doesn't seem to be a cell cycle specificity to this, but we can see a defect in double strand rate repair using gamma ray H2AX as a marker. Um, so that was all published. The next two slides show some unpublished work that we've gone on to pursue now. So we're obviously interested in making knockout systems instead of knockdown systems. And we've done this in two ways. We've, made, we've got the knockout mouse now, but we, we're still we're just making the mess from that to do some cellular analyses. But in advance of that, we, did a knock, we made a knockout in chicken DT40 cells. And these are very good cells for making single and double gene deletions because they, they have high rates of targeting um, um, frequencies. So we can make knockouts relatively easily. Uh, T-trap, it turns out, is gone chromosome 2 in chicken cells. So you, and that's means you have to knock out three alleles because there are three copies of chromosome two which makes it a bit more problematic but it's still not too difficult and this just the southern block showing the knockout was successful but the important data is shown on here which is now that when you look at the autophyside sensitivity of a complete t-trap knockout there's exquisite sensitivity so there's down to three orders of magnitude cell kill here in the knockout very little cell kill in the wild type we have two controls here wild type with all three wild type alleles and one where we just have one um, intact allele remaining, but you can see the top side is only killing the knockout. No sensitivity to camptothecin, again, in, in agreement with the absence of s significant activity of this protein um, on top one lesions, at least in mammalian cells, probably because TDP1 is there. Okay, so the conclusions then are that human cells do contain an efficient and specific 5' tyrosyl phosphodiesterase, and it's called T-TRAP. These enzymes are complementary phosphodiesterases, so together they provide the cell with the capacity to take off trapped top isomerase from either a 3' or a 5' terminus. And that's really important because top 1 and top 2 um, will be generating these kinds of abortive lesions at a certain frequency uh, all of the time. So it's not just when you give them camptothecin or atopicide. These will be arising at a certain frequency of all top isomerase events. Um, and T-trap accelerates the repair of and resistance to top 2 induced double strand breaks in cells. And we're actually now pushing to have T-trap denoted TDP2, uh, which is more in line with its, with its um, catalytic activity. And there are likely to be other types of protein-linked termini, and we're very interested in determining whether um, T-trap is involved in processing any of those. Some viral integrases, for example, will generate substrates that might well be, um, will generate uh, breaks that might well be substrates for TDP2. So how does this fit into the currently accepted schemes for double-strand break repair? Well, I have just one slide to summarize that. So this is a TDP2-induced double-strand break. The first step of repair of this is already known. It involves a proteolytic step, just like the repair of top one breaks. So the proteasome will chew off most of this trapped TOPO2 peptide, leaving you with phosphotyrosyl um, linkages on each 5' prime terminus of the double-strand break. Normally, it's been um, argued that the way this phosphotyrosyl terminus will be processed is nucleolytically. So a nuclease will actually clip off the DNA at the 5' prime terminus, so thereby releasing the um, tyrosyl link fragment. And that, would work, that could work in two contexts or two types of double strand break repair. The first one would be a process called non-homologous end joining, which involves the proteins Q and DNAPK. And the nucleases here would likely be MRN or Artemis, so that would clip off the tyrosyl linkage, leaving a double-strand break that can now be uh, rejoined by the Q complex and ligase 4. Alternatively, in proliferating cells, you could process this double-strand break using a nuclease such as MRN and then channel the double-strand break into homologous combination. And these are two very effective ways of repairing double-strand breaks. Okay? So, but they do have particular um, consequences to a cell depending on cell cycle phase, for example. So in the case of non-homologous end joining, this would be a very effective way of rejoining the break, but it would be error prone. So the problem here is that because you're clipping off sequence information at the tip of the five prime, both five prime termini, when you stick this DNA back together, you've lost genetic information. 
Now, in a, in a long-lived post-mitotic cell, such as a neuron, that's potentially problematic because it means that during the lifetime of that neuron, which of course could be 80, 90 years, you could be accumulating deletions whenever TOPO2 generates one of these breaks. And we already know that TOPO isomerase induced damage is a threat to the nervous system from the fact that TDP1 gives you this neurological disorder if it's mutated. Homologous combination doesn't have that problem, so this is a very faithful, effective way of repairing double strand breaks where you use the intact sister chromatid to replace any missing information that you chopped off using the nuclease. But the problem with homologous recombination, as far as the nervous system is concerned, is that this, is the, this, is only, uh, an, this system's only available in proliferating cells, so you couldn't use this system in post-mitotic neurons anyway. So we think, in actual fact, that what TDP2 or TTRAP does is provide an alternative which is instead of chopping the DNA, the DNA termini now, you can cleanly hydrolyze this phosphotyrosyl linkage. And that generates a double strand break that's actually very much like a restriction endonuclease generated break. It's a five prime overhang, it has cohesive ends, and you can simply ligate it. So TDP2 would allow now a ligation event that would be completely error free. So we think this has potential utility in long lived post mitotic neurons because it avoids um, error prone pathways. Um, which would otherwise result in uh, accumulation of deletions. TDP2 may also impact on cancer incidence. So atopicide is used in the treatment of a broad range of cancers, and I've listed those here. And atopicide works exclusively by inducing TOPO2 damage. So we're very interested in the idea now that TDP2 um, is a potential biomarker. So, for example, TDP2 levels might vary in different cancers and that might predict their sensitivity to atopicide. You can get atopicide resistant tumors and it's possible that some of that resistance results from upregulation of TDP2. So those are the sorts of questions that we're looking at with respect to cancer. And if that's the case, if we see any evidence of that, then, ob then obviously um, development of TDP2 inhibitors might have potential clinical utility. I think I'm going to leave it at that. Um, the people who have uh, conducted this work are Felipe, I mentioned, and Sharif. Zihong uh, generated the DT40 knockout system, so he's involved in conducting the analysis of those cells. And Kay and Maria are two technicians in the lab, and they've been assisting uh, Felipe and Sharif. <coughs> so the work in my lab is funded by the MRC, Medical Research Council, BBSRC. So these are both funding agencies from the government, and uh, uh, Cancer Research UK is obviously a major cancer uh, charity in the UK. And uh, as, as Andro said, this is the Genome Centre. So if anybody wants to come to the Sussex, I can't promise all year round sunshine, but in summer we get a fair amount of nice sunshine, nice beach as well. Um, if any of you want to come along, just give me a, drop me an email. And at that point, I'll take any questions if you have any. <laughs>